Cobra Kai revisits old rivals Daniel LaRusso and Johnny Lawrence over 30 years after the 1984 classic Karate Kid. Since its move to Netflix last year, it has become one of the most popular series on any streaming platform. I'm Rob LaCuria, Senior Editor at God DVD with Cobra Kai, co-creators John Hurwitz, Josh Heald and Hayden Schlossberg. Guys, when the show first premiered, um, I was immediately drawn to it because it brought back characters from my childhood. So I found it very compelling that underdog LaRusso was now the successful guy and family man, while tough guy Lawrence became the down and outer and, uh, and, and kind of almost a no hoper to begin with. So like, I'm wondering, um, Josh, if you could just talk us through briefly why did you initially decide to essentially turn the tables on these two iconic characters? Well, I mean, it would be very easy to say we did it because it would be a subversion of the expectations, but um, it also felt very natural as to what very likely would have happened and could have happened um, with a story where an underdog achieves you know, his high school pinnacle moment and, you know, essentially throws the winning touchdown and gets the girl and, you know, the whole town comes out and puts him on their shoulders and says, you're the best. And, you know, the guy who was formerly the, you know, the wonder kid and, you know, could do anything and, and had a couple championships under his belt um, falls from grace and, you know, handles himself, you know, not as delicately as he could have and becomes vilified. Um, it felt very natural that, Daniel's trajectory was was going up, 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 and Johnny's was at a tipping point where it was starting to go down. Um, and you know, when you take that movie and then add to it the the cold open of the Karate Kid Part Two, where you see that you know Johnny is essentially abandoned by his coach, and you realize he had no mentor, and you're seeing even more that Daniel has such a great influence in his life and Mr. Miyagi, you're that there's so much wind in his sails that how could he not be successful? How could he not have a head on his shoulders and a stability in his life? And it wasn't a stretch to imagine that Johnny, if you dig under the surface and wonder why he fell in with a guy like Kreese um, and gave his soul over to him, um, how, you know, where he must have come from in terms of his own family dynamic. And it made us, you know, feel comfortable filling in some of those blanks in terms of what was his home life like or what could it have been like um, to send him into the arms of Crease in the first place. And then when you don't have that that hammock to fall back into when a guy like Crease abandons you, what becomes of your life? So it was a very natural subversion of what the movie set up, but it was also a very natural continuation of where we thought it was inevitably going. You know, yeah. we also, I was just gonna say, we also, yeah. you know, have yeah. always been, you know, huge fans of the Karate Kid, but also huge fans of William Zapka in general. You know, we loved him in the Karate Kid and we loved him in all those, you know, 80s movies where he was that basically iconic, you know, 80s bully in a number of films. So, you know, separate from just our, our love of the Karate Kid, the three of us were fascinated by Zapka, you know, when we were growing up. And, you know, always talked about him and, and, you know, had a fascination with the idea of bullies and bullying and what becomes of bullies. So, you know, this felt like a, a also a natural, natural vehicle to be able to explore that kind of a character with one of the most iconic bullies of all time. What happens later in life to somebody who, you know, maybe isn't the nicest guy in high school. And uh, the idea of giving him his own sort of redemption story uh, was something that uh, felt like it could be really funny, but also really layered and really examining another side of, you know, a character that you thought you knew. Yeah. And Hayden, have you got anything to add to that? Because I totally, um, that whole William Zabka narrative really, really affected me just from, you know, my own personal experience. <clears throat> Yeah, I think it, it allowed us to examine bullying in, a, in an interesting way. You know, you're usually going in through the, um, through the eyes of the underdog and the kid who's getting bullied because that's what, you know, draws you to the characters um, in, in these types of stories. But, um, you know, with, with Billy Zapka's Johnny Lawrence character, he is this iconic bully. So right off the bat, you're on the side of the bully. But as John said, you know, later in life, a lot of times those people who are the kings of high school are, are, are 
you know, are lost. And so he is an underdog as an adult. Um, he is somebody who is a loser as an adult. And yet all he knows, the only skills he has are those old school bully, you know, um, you know, um, skills that he learned, you know, from karate. So it, it was an interesting way to kind of get into the mind of a bully, what makes a bully. And, um, and th that theme is, you know, a big part of the show. It's so immensely satisfying for anyone who hasn't seen the show yet. You'll see that. I mean, everybody's been through something like bullying. Hopefully you're the, you know, you're, the, you're not the bully, but it's something that's very universal. And to see that, you know, we, we can, we can touch on this show by saying, you know, um, the bullies peaked a bit early and that's kind of what Johnny's story is to begin with, at least. Um, sticking with you, Hayden, um, I, you know, YouTube gave you guys this opportunity to bring this show to life and we're very grateful for it. But having Netflix pick it up uh, after YouTube decided not to do original programming anymore and then um, put it on the Netflix platform has really just been such a game changer, hasn't it? It really has. It's uh, Ralph Macchio's described it as, you know, having the successful off-Broadway play or musical that then is on Broadway. And, and it's it, it feels like that's where it belonged the whole time. And truthfully, when we developed this show, we really developed it for Netflix and Netflix's audience. And it was only Suzanne Daniels at YouTube and her passion for, you know, giving YouTube a shot and giving another streamer a shot and, and allowing us the creative freedom to do the show that we wanted to do and a full season of it without even seeing a script. That was the offer that we couldn't refuse. And, you know, to her credit, she let us make the show that we really wanted. It was as much a success at YouTube as it could possibly be there. Um, but the whole time we were thinking, you know, this would be, uh, you know, that much more successful if our parents knew how to, you know, watch the show and we didn't have to guide them through all the processes to become a YouTube, um, you know, premium subscriber. So, yeah, just as soon as it got on Netflix, it had that audience um, that we were looking for. It's also an, uh, a global audience. And, you know, this the Karate Kid franchise was huge, you know, all over the world. And we felt that that was a big portion of the audience that you know that we weren't really getting at youtube and immediately you saw you know in places like latin america and you know the uk australia all of a sudden we had this like much bigger fan base almost overnight yeah it, it must be very um, vindicating i guess guys uh, and i'm speaking more about in terms of the reach that the show now has um like josh have you noticed that you're that you're, you're now able to kind of plan the show out in a bit more um in a, in a concrete manner, you know that where the show is headed now that it's on Netflix, or it was never really that about that. It was more just about reaching more eyeballs. You know, I don't think our approach to the show has changed uh, <laughs> since going to Netflix. You know, we were we always had a you know a lengthy number of seasons in our head and an end game in sight. And you know, the moment we got to YouTube, you know, obviously they were planning on bigger things for their platform at the time they acquired our show. And we were writing toward our own end game and never really writing to the box that we thought we might be in at any given time. Um, you know, there was there were a moment when we realized that YouTube was not leaning into scripted um, original programming anymore that, you know, was frightening for us as, you know, creators knowing where we had left the show and, you know, and knowing in our hearts that it belonged, you know, on, on a bigger platform at that time. Um, so once once it made the move to Netflix, there was a you know a sigh of relief that it's it's kind of come home to where we always thought it needed to be. But we've we've continued to kind of pace out the show, um, even in those you know kind of uh, anxiety ridden moments of is this it? Um, we tried not to like skip to the next chapter. We we've we've tried to course out the story that we have in our heads um, at a pace that feels like the show has earned at this point. And, uh, you know, it's our hope that we'll, you know, with the Netflix audience behind it, that we'll be able to continue to tell this story and not feel like we have to ever tell an abridged conclusion to it. Yeah. And I think, um, John, the, the other part of this success story is not only the Netflix pickup, but we all just have been through the most horrifying year, the pandemic, obviously, and I just hit at the right time. Like a lot of us were at home, 
Um, there's been a lot of misery out there. And then we get this show. Some of us already knew about it. Some of us didn't which is a little aspirational and it's fun and it's nostalgic. And so, John, did, don't you, like, it's just kind of like kismet. Everything has happened for a reason and now you guys are, are hitting it out of the park and people are really enjoying a show when out of their house things are kind of a bit grim. So don't you think that that also helped? Oh, absolutely. You know, this has obviously been a very tough year for everybody. Um, and, you know, as you know, our show is making its sort of slow journey over to Netflix because, you know, uh, before the pandemic hit, we knew that the show was going to be, you know, leaving YouTube, but we didn't know where it would be. Um, our hope was Netflix, but there was a process. We, we, were, we went around sort of pitching the show and the future of the show to a bunch of places and then the pandemic hit and then all business sort of stopped. So there was a period of time where, you know, we weren't sure exactly how things were going to unfold, but you just felt, you know, in your own viewing habits and in the viewing habits of, you know, your friends and family, that people wanted to see something that makes them smile, that, that you know, uh, you know, serves in a sense, our show serves as comfort food in a lot of ways for people, because part of it's that nostalgic element and these characters that you're uh, you know, have a, have a connection to for so many years from, you know, in the eyes of many from a better time in their lives. A war, it's a warm and fuzzy feeling thinking of the Karate Kid. Um, but, you know, our, our, our show, uh, it's easy, easy to digest. You know, it's the episodes are, are you know, they're, they're quick, they're fast moving. Uh, there's a lot of laughs. You're emotionally invested. You know, sometimes you'll cry and you'll have those emotions, but, you know, the, the tears are followed by laughter. Um, and uh, it really was the perfect time for for people to have this little escape with with Cobra Kai. And, you know, we were we were thrilled, you know, anytime somebody says to us that like the show helped them, you know, uh, find some laughs and smile during the during this challenging period. We feel you know really good that uh, it ended up on Netflix at this time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's this term that gets thrown around now called co-viewing. Um, when we were kids, it was just called watching TV. You know, you had <laughs> one or two TVs in your house and the whole family watched what was on um, at eight o'clock at night and you all watched the show together. That kind of went away in recent years, you know, with the, you know, television and, and streaming in general has gotten so fragmented and so specific that there's almost one show that appeals to every single person on the planet and it's just their show. Yeah. Um, you know, the audience has become just so segmented, but this show, what we found early on, and there wasn't an intent to it where we said, we're going to write a show that gets families around the TV together, but it happened naturally because the Karate Kid was that kind of movie that appealed to different generations and had universal stories to tell that hit you, whether you were, you know, 40 or 14 or, you know, or, or 68 and, right away we we found out that this show was reaching all those people and they were actually watching it together and you're hearing anecdotal stories of my son and I or my daughter and I our family has not sat down and watched a show that we all enjoyed together um in a while and this is one of them so when you're trapped in your house for a year with your children um it was, it, you know I know from even our family we'd seen the show there was something nice about it coming on Netflix and it's one button and oh my gosh, there it is. And uh, that, that must, that must be a, a good feeling. It's such a dream. You're so right. For us, it's the Marvel movies and Cobra Kai. We all get together on the couch and just devour. Um, so you're hundred percent correct there. Let's just dive in a little um, into season three. Cause it was, it just ended in an, on an immensely satisfying way. And I don't really want to spoil it, but I mean, I can probably say, and if you haven't seen the show, maybe just go away, watch it come back. But um uh, who's best place to talk us through why you decided to finally get the old rivals together? Because I've been saying it in my head, come on, we need we need you guys to start working together. Forget the old grudges. You finally did it. That was a very em uh, emotional and immensely satisfying way to end the season. Who's best place to talk us through that? Um, well, I could... Hayden, why don't you take Yeah, it? yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we've, uh, from the very beginning, when we conceived of the show, we really wanted to set up um, these classic rivals in a way where you saw their similarities in addition to their differences. And you realize that while they are the yin and the yang and on opposite ends of the karate spectrum, they 
in a lot of ways parallel, uh, parallel each other in terms of their backstories. I mean, uh, and in terms of having their shared common past. And so there's this, this uh, innate feeling in the audience that you just want to see, you know, the yin and the yang come together and, uh, and, and fight for the same cause. And we basically spent the first, you know, three seasons building up that, that rivalry, knowing that we would want to have this moment where they come together. And it was always our intention to have uh, the character Elizabeth Shue plays Ali with an eye to be that uh, catalyst that kind of snaps them out of it and makes them realize what the hell are you guys arguing about? You know, you're both the same person. And that was, that was something that we talked about early on. And, you know, when you talk about the YouTube and the Netflix drama of the show, you know, we really wanted to be able to get to that place where, um, where Ali came into our story and helped our characters come together. And now there's, you know, as, as this show goes on in, in season four and beyond, you get to see where that develops. But we knew that this would be an awesome, powerful way to end the season, just a, a huge crowd pleaser. Um, and also coming off the way we ended season two, which was more uh, heartbreaking. You know, we wanted to have that big F yeah moment uh, for everybody who's been on this journey with us. Yeah. Like season two really was quite gutting. The end of season three, we were literally clapping with our two hands, like in our own home, like crazy people. So yeah, it actually worked. Um, John, I was also thinking that this show, what this show does really well is it humanises the villains. So we talked about how Johnny was a bully and now we, we understand, you know, where he's coming from and how he's down and out. But Chris, when, when Chris was introduced, I was like, oh, I really hate that guy. I don't want, I didn't want to see him. Um, but by the end of the season, season three, um, we kind of understood more about him and, uh, and his philosophy about no mercy. And I really, really appreciated that. So what went into trying to give Chris other dimensions and nuances? You know, it's sort of a, one of the hallmarks of the show for us is to take these characters that you think you know and really explain why they are the way they are and where they come from. You know, it started with Johnny, obviously, in season one, and we've been following his story. But, you know, when you think about Kreese in The Karate Kid, he's just bad. He's a bad guy. <laughs> you know, That's and, it. you know, th th we did get, you know, a taste of things, you know, especially in Karate Kid 3, a little bit more about, you know, his his uh, history at war. Um, but these weren't things that were laced in in a way for you to understand him better and like and, you know, sympathize with him or, you know, get where he comes from. You know, for us, it was really starting from a place of, OK, you know, we're spending time with this character. Let's get under the hood. Let's figure out what makes a guy. Uh, so determined to have this, you know, strike first, strike hard, no mercy mentality that he believes in in the way that he does. Uh, and we knew that he had a history in war. So, you know, we thought about sort of his home life and where he came from and, you know, liked the idea of showing that like there was a human there. There was a guy who, you know, could have been any one of us that in fact, a guy who was determined to become a hero and, you know, and, and as you see him on the show, I think he still views himself as a hero. He views himself as a guy who is teaching valuable lessons to the youth of the valley. And even though those lessons are warped by these tragic experiences that he's gone through, we at least know where they're coming from, as opposed to just him having this evil gene inside of him. He believes that these are lessons that people should uh, would help people survive because he he needed these kinds of lessons to survive and to kind of cope with the trauma of his life. So, uh, you know, we, we we since again before we started even writing season one, we event we knew that eventually we'd want to get to the place that we were where we could explore Crease and make him a, a, a full three dimensional character that even if you're not exactly rooting for him, at least you understand him. Yeah, and look, in the opposite go for um for LaRusso, you know, I mean, as someone like myself who kind of idolised Ruff Marchi growing up and then watching him now on the show, and he can be a bit of an arsehole sometimes, and that's okay. Like, we can handle that now because <laughs> it's kind of real. <laughs> it's authentic. Um, 
So that brings me to this final question. Um, Josh, I saw all over social media that you guys have just finished shooting season four, uh, which is awesome, which means we're going to get it soon because we're not waiting too much longer is going to be really quite painful. So talk (laughs) us through what what you can tell us about season four without spoiling anything. I can't tell you uh, much of anything other than (laughs) it's very, very big. Um, it tried the production of it tried to kill us again as it does uh, every year and uh, we persevered and uh, we made it. Um, it it continues to deliver on the premise you know we we ended season three in that big way that Hayden talked about that we knew we were getting to that point it's the you know will these guys each put down their weapons and and look at each other and say let's give this a shot um, so you know we are going to continue that story you know we're not leaving that story hanging, um, but what will what will happen? You know, that's that's not something we are going to get into before the show comes out. We love, you know, nothing more than for people to be surprised by the, you know, the big package with the bow on it when, you know, the, the episodes become bingeable. Um, and we try to protect as much as possible while, you know, playing the game of you have to tease and you have to, you know, you have to introduce, you know, certain storylines and, and there will be some big you know, teases that that will come out along the way that will start to, um, you know, put some breadcrumbs out there. But right now I can just say that I, I believe, you know, in, and I know all three of us believe in our hearts, we've delivered upon the promise of what that, that big goosebump moment at the end of season three presented. Um, and uh, I think we all feel very, very strongly and very uh, happy with what we've shot. And now we are in the you know, the, the, the fun place of uh, tweaking and, and putting it all together in post-production and making sure that um, it reflects everything we know it will be when it comes out. Okay, so we're just going to have to be patient. I, I didn't think you were going to tell me anything. Um, there's lots of karate. There's lots of karate. There's a lot of karate. There. <laughs> Josh, you weren't supposed to say that. Uh, Come on, you've, it. you've ruined it. You've ruined it. Um, but, you know, the pressure is on, guys, because you did get, you know, 90% at Rotten Tomatoes for season three. Like, that's nothing to sneeze at. Our critics are really taking notice of the show for what it is, a fun, escapist, compelling show about redemption and friendship and, um, and and forgiveness like the, and it and it really means a lot to a lot of us and hopefully Emmy voters are going to start noticing it as well now that it's on a bigger platform so guys congrats on a great season three and we're really looking forward to season four thank you very thank much you. thank you so much